Hi, everybody. And on the show today, we have a special guest by the name of Robert George. He is a professor at Princeton University, as well as one of our tenured five minute video presenters. We just put out a video this past week with Robbie, who uh, went over the difference between a republic and a democracy. Uh, Mr. George, thank you so much for being on the program. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So you put out a story on Twitter that really went viral. Everybody's been talking about it, about a man by the name of Dorian Abbott getting somewhat canceled at MIT. And for our viewers that haven't heard this story yet, I kind of want you to go over your your retelling of what happened here. Well, yes. Um, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, has a pretty good claim to being the most distinguished STEM university in the world, uh, science, uh, technology, engineering, mathematics. It's an extraordinary place filled with extraordinary scientists and other scholars. Dorian Abbott is a geophysicist, uh, a tenured uh, member of the faculty at the University of Chicago, another very, very distinguished institution. And for his work in geophysics, and especially his work uh, in the area of climatology and astrophysics, he was invited by MIT to give one of its major distinguished honorific named lectures. It's called the Carlson Lecture, and he accepted that invitation and was scheduled to give the lecture on October 21st at MIT. Everything seemed fine. This is the normal way things are done uh, in academia. But then when the lecture was publicized, a relatively small group of graduate students and other activists decided that they would try to get the lecture canceled. They campaigned to cancel the lecture, not because of anything they anticipated uh, Professor Abbott saying during the lecture, which was going to be on how we determine what the climate is like on planets outside our solar system. Rather, they wanted it to be canceled because they don't like Dorian Abbott's views on questions of affirmative action, racial preferences and admissions and hiring and so forth, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Professor Abbott and a co-author had written a little piece for Newsweek in which they criticized the current orthodoxy on university campuses when it comes to so-called DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and proposed instead that we replace that with what they called merit, fairness, and equality. He made a perfectly reasonable argument for a perfectly reasonable position, in fact, a commendable position in which we would be treating uh, people as individuals, uh, not categorizing people by groups and awarding places based on group identity and, and so forth. But of course, this was unacceptable to the woke. So the, the mob formed, they put pressure on MIT, and this distinguished Institute of Science and Technology, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, in eight days, eight days, caved into the mob and canceled Dorian Abbott's lecture. Well, when this came to mind, it, it, it should amaze you. It should horrify you. It should horrify everybody. This is not how science proceeds. This is not how scholarship proceeds. We do not let politically motivated mobs cancel distinguished scholarly or scientific lectures. So I was not going to take this lying down. When it came to my attention, Professor Abbott uh, brought it to my attention. When it came to my attention, I immediately uh, shared the information with my colleagues at the Academic Freedom Alliance, uh, which I helped to found some months ago. I also took to social media, particularly to Twitter, to call attention to the disgraceful behavior of MIT officials at uh, MIT. Uh, when MIT refused to uh, come to its senses on this, when they informed the Academic Freedom Alliance that they intended to maintain the cancellation of the lecture, uh, I then arranged for Professor Abbott to be invited to give the very lecture on the very date and at the very time it was to be given at MIT at Princeton under the auspices of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, which I founded and have the honor to, uh, to direct. So the lecture is going to go forward. People are going to hear, in fact, thousands upon thousands of people have signed up to hear it. Uh, it's going to be uh, by Zoom. And so we've had an amazing number of people registering to hear the lecture, probably many more than would have heard it at, uh, at MIT. In fact, I'm sure of that. But this show is going to go on. It's just not going to go on at, um, at MIT. It's shameful 
what MIT has done here. Absolutely shameful, disgraceful. They should be hanging their heads or, or, or walking away with their tail between their legs. Really what they should do is say, you know what? We made a mistake. We apologize. We caved into pressure. We should never have done that. We're going to we're going to redo this thing here and we're going to have Professor Abbott come on October 21st and give the lecture in MIT. And I would grad gladly uh, hand that lecture back over to them. But uh, since that doesn't seem to be happening, we're going to be hosting the lecture at Princeton. Yeah, he's lucky. He's he's had he's been able to network and create a wider audience for this, but there are people that don't have that opportunity. And it seems to be uh, an epidemic within universities and these college settings. I mean, we saw it with Peter Bogosian having to leave his university. We saw it with the, the C-16 bill that Jordan Peterson had to deal with. And it seems like professors nowadays who make completely benign statements that really point to a more uh, objective truth or a better solution to everything going on right now are starting to be canceled increasingly so. What do you think that says about the college and university system as we have it today? It doesn't say anything very good about contemporary higher education, and it doesn't say anything any good about our culture. Uh, what's happening in higher ed is reflecting broader trends uh, in the intellectual and, and indeed the popular culture. But it's especially bad that it is happening in colleges and universities. Those institutions' very reason for being is truth seeking. And if we want the truth to be sought, if we want to be a culture that has a flourishing a truth seeking project in our colleges and universities and our educational system, we need to recognize that freedom of thought, inquiry, discussion, expression is to intellectual life what oxygen is to biological life. If we, if we allow freedom of thought and inquiry and speech to collapse, Intellectual life in this cultural culture will die in the same way that if you deprive a person of oxygen for several minutes, they're going to die. And that would be a tragedy beyond reckoning. And so that's why at least some of us in academic life are saying, we are not going to put up with this. We are not going to let this happen. We're going to fight back with every breath in our body uh, and by every legitimate means uh, we can find. And this is just one example of that, of that fighting back. And, and because you're fighting, I'm assuming you're, you're optimistic about the situation with universities and colleges and the route that they're going to go down. Do you think the pendulum does truly swing back after all this insanity? Well, I, uh, I can't uh, confess to being optimistic, but I can confess to being hopeful. Uh, there's a difference. Uh, optimism is a prediction of what's going to happen. Hope is a virtue and virtues are active things. When one has hope, one is dedicated to making it happen. One plans to be part of the solution. Uh, so that's what I have. I have hope. And I'm encouraged in that hope by so many of my fellow academics here at Princeton and around the country, including some who've now written in from MIT who are appalled at what their institution has done. So many people saying, you know what? We're just not going to allow this to happen. We're not going to take this anymore. We are going to fight back. The Academic Freedom Alliance being formed is a very good um, step in that direction. It's, it's part of this movement, movement of hope, really, uh, keeping hope alive to turn things around in contemporary higher education. Amazing. Now, funnily enough, you just did a five minute video with us that talks about the difference between a republic and a democracy. And you make the point that a republic keeps power from being concentrated in one place. And you talk about the, the issue of mob rule. Now, it seems like we are experiencing mob rule, but not by a majority anymore. It's by a, a very small minority that is starting to control the way our institutions function in America. How do you think that happened and, and what do you think the solution is to, to this sort of rule? The mob figured out a tactic that works. At least it's worked for them so far. And that tactic is intimidation. They think, and so far they've had a lot of success, that by vilifying people, stigmatizing people, defaming people, they will have all of us so scared that we will bend to their will. Either we will go along with what they want to do, or we will stand by in silence as they do it. Now, that's bullying. That's all that is. It's bullying. The minority is getting its way by bullying. Now, I don't know what your mom and dad taught you about what you do when you have a bully. Mine taught me is that you, you, that you don't allow that bully to intimidate you. 
you stand your ground against that bully and pretty soon you'll find them backing down because in the heart of every bully is a coward. And when you stand up to a coward, they're going to, they're going to run away. And I'm going to stand up. And I know a lot of my colleagues now in academia, academia are going to stand up to these bullies. Amazing. Now, I, I've heard from a lot of conservative students. We obviously, our, our show is watched vastly by, by young conservatives. A lot of them are, are fearful of even entering colleges and universities now because they simply view them as indoctrination centers. And this story out of MIT that you've highlighted is, is evidence of that. What do you say to the kids who are no longer entrusting uh, their education to universities and colleges? Is that a rightful decision or is that something that they should face and try to fix? Well, I think you have to be careful in your decision making. You have to be judicious in your judgment about where you're going to go to college. Uh, there are colleges that are better and colleges that are worse. There are some, a handful, mostly small places, that are really good pretty much across the board. And then there are others that are complete disasters. Uh, and it's hard for me to recommend that a student go to one that's a complete disaster where that student is constantly feeling as though he or she is under pressure to conform, whether he or she actually agrees or not, where independence of thought is stifled, uh, where conformism is the, is the rule. But then there are a lot of institutions that are in between, a whole lot of such institutions. At these institutions, everything depends on the courses you select and above all the professors who are teaching those courses. So if you uh, uh, want to go to Harvard, for example, it's one of those in-between places. And if you've, you've got the credentials that will enable you to get into Harvard, uh, you can get a great education at Harvard even today. Now, there are going to be some professors who are just going to do indoctrination. And you have to worry that if you don't go along, they'll even dock your grades. There are such people. It's terrible. It's a real sin uh, against the ethics of, in of uh, intellectual life to do that. But it happens. You'll know who those professors are. The word spreads. Stay away from them. You don't even learn from them anyway. They're not really interested in teaching you. They're interested in indoctrinating you. Indoctrination is the very opposite of education. It's the antithesis of education. I'd rather people be ignorant than be indoctrinated. Of course, I don't want anybody to be ignorant. I want learning. But if, it's, if those are the only two options, indoctrination or ignorance, I'll take the ignorance because at least then we still have hope. We haven't turned people into automatons. The day will come maybe when they can learn something. But there are still plenty of professors. Again, I'm just sticking with one example, Harvard. Uh, the same would be true at a lot of great state universities around the country, a lot of other private universities, small and large around the country. You choose wisely. You choose the best professors. You study with the best uh, professors. Now, at these institutions, sometimes there are mandatory courses or courses that are mandatory if you want to do advanced work in a certain field. And sometimes you're just going to have to put up with a professor that it would be best to avoid if you possibly could. Um, there you just have to ha put your head down and bull through. But even in those cases, I want to be very clear. Do not be a conformist. Challenge that professor. If that professor is giving you a set of readings and they're all on one side, that's what indoctrination is. That's how it works. They give you a set of readings on a controversial topic and all the readings are on one side, the professor's own side. You go to that professor privately. You don't have to have a big confrontation. And you say, professor, I've been doing these readings. They're very interesting. Uh, can you recommend a reading or two that challenges what I'm uh, being told in the readings that uh, I've had so, so far? I mean, who are the best writers on the opposite side of this question? No matter what the issue is, put the professor on the spot. I think at that point, you're going to have a very embarrassed professor who's going to start mumbling a few things. Whatever you do, do not say things you don't believe, even to get good grades. We need some courage here, including for our young people. Now, we also need it for older people. And a lot of professors themselves are not exemplifying courage. Our biggest problem is, is, is the lack of courage right now, uh, especially among uh, the, the grown-ups. But even as young men and women going through the educational process, don't compromise yourself by saying things you don't believe, even to get good grades. That impacts your character. You don't want that. It might get you the A. It might get you on to the next step, but it has a negative impact on your character. You need to be a truth teller. You need to be a truth seeker, and a truth seeker is a truth speaker. Don't say things that are false. I can't recommend that to anybody. 
Um, just, uh, I'd, I'd put it in religious terms, trust in the Lord and move ahead. Uh, speak the truth as God gives you to see the truth. Don't become a conformist. Wow. Everybody listen up. Are you taking notes? Because this is straight from the horse's mouth at Princeton University. You need to know that this is what you need to do. Now, Robert, I want to end on, on one final note. Now, Jordan Peterson states that dialogue is the avenue to truth. And now there's a group of people in this country and really across the world that is trying to shut down that avenue to truth. And I place a lot of blame on students that try to cancel people like Dorian Abbott simply for having views that were so outside of the subject matter that he was going to be speaking about at MIT. But I also place a lot of blame on the professors and administrators that allowed that to take place. Uh, what is your message to those people who are trying to shut down that avenue to truth? I would remind them that we have the word academic and we use it in the way we use it today because of something that uh, existed way back in classical antiquity in Athens, Plato's Academy, where young men came to argue and debate. Now, why did they come to argue and debate, not just be indoctrinated? They came because Plato, who was taught by his own teacher Socrates, believed, as we should all believe, that the way to get to the truth is to consider the best arguments on both or all sides of questions on which reasonable people of goodwill disagree. And that is almost all questions. I mean, almost all questions that actually come to the fore in academic life are questions on which reasonable people of goodwill disagree. I happen to be a conservative, old-fashioned, strong uh, uh, conservative. But there are reasonable people of goodwill on the progressive side who disagree with me. And if we're going to get at the truth of things, I need to be open to listening to what they have to say, listening to their arguments, listening to the best arguments to be made for nationalized health care or whatever the issue is that they are uh, promoting. And they if they're to get at the truth of things, need to listen and allow themselves to be challenged by people like me who challenge that progressive uh, uh, ideology. That's how we're going to get to the truth of things. Uh, we're fallible, all of us, every single one of us. We can make mistakes, intellectual mistakes as well as moral mistakes. And we can make mistakes not only about the small, trivial, superficial matters of life, life. We can make mistakes about big things. And in the past, we know conservatives have made big mistakes and progressives have made big mistakes. If you want details, I'll go into them for you. So we know we're no better than our forebears. We're made of flesh and blood and skin and bone. We're fallible just as they are. There are things we might very well be mistaken on, again, whether you're on the right or the left. Now, how are we going to move if we are in error from error to truth? How are we going to figure out that we're in error by allowing ourselves to be challenged? If we shut down people who disagree with us, we're going to be stuck in our era, error. We're going to be in that echo chamber, constantly reinforced by our friends, told that, oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah, you're right. We're never going to get out of the, the rut of error and back on the track of truth. So let's be Socratic. Let's be like Plato. Let's, let's make today's academy like Plato's academy, where the best arguments, the best positions, the best that's been thought and said on competing sides of questions is shared with our students so that they can learn to think more deeply, more critically, and above all, for themselves. Wow, fantastic. I think there's no better way to sum up that. Uh, what I want to say is Thank you so much for being on the show. It's really been a pleasure. If you guys want to hear more from this very brilliant man, he does have a five minute video that we put out last week that goes over the differences between a republic and a democracy. Robert, how else can people support you in your endeavors? Well, I'm active in social media. My uh, Facebook friend list has hit, hit the limit, although people can get onto the waiting list. Uh, Twitter, there is no limit. So I'm uh, uh, there. My Twitter handle, handle is at McCormickProf. Uh, also, I have a website. It's simply robertpgeorge. I think it's com. <laughs> <C -O -M, laughs> robertpgeorge. com. Uh, I'm an old guy. The social media is still something I'm getting the hang of. Robertpgeorge. com, which includes many of my writings, access to my to my books, um, a calendar of my speaking engagements, videos of my past lectures, even my musical performances. I. Uh, I'm a bluegrass banjo player. I was born and brought up oh, in the hills oh. of West Virginia, and that's our native music and I play a lot of banjo and some of my banjo videos are up. So that website, robertpgeorge.com uh, is up there for anybody who'd like to learn more about 
what I think or how I sound. <laughs> that is great. We're going to leave those links also down in the description below if you guys want to see more and hear more and read more. Robert, thank you again for being on the show. It's really been a pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thank you.